ladies and gentlemen, it is your host with the most, Avril R32 here, and destroy the ever-living boo-boo stain off of that tier 1 tier element subscribe button. We're very close to 1300 at the time of making this video, we're actually literally two subscribers away from 1300. So, I'm going to positively assume that we've made it to 1300 by the time I post this video. So, thank you all for 1300 subscribers. This is going to be probably my longest and probably most in-depth Yu-Gi-Oh! in-depth episode I have made to date. Obviously, this series started because the Purely episode was so successful, continues to be successful at almost 8,000 views. People want to know how to play Purely, how to beat the deck, what the choke points are. Well, we've done that for Sky Striker. We've done it for Rice Gaze. Now, we're going to do it for Tier Element, ladies and gentlemen. A used-to-be Tier 0 deck that is still very very powerful so i'm going to be breaking all this down choke points how to easily beat the deck spoiler alert if you d shift the hell out of this deck uh, you can basically just bend the tier element player over and start spanking them on the ass like they're a bad baby because uh, they're not gonna be able to play the game it's just like dark world they're not gonna be able to play the game also i'm showing off specifically a tier element horse build and I'm saying that because of the fact that I want to explain why the horse engine is just bad, in my opinion. Because it's basically win more. Like, if you don't see the engine, then they're bad mills. If you do see it, it's like you were probably going to win the ball game without those cards anyway. You could substitute in King of the Swamps and still win. So, with all that in mind, sit back, relax. This is going to be a long video, so be sure you like it. Save it to your favorites. Save it to your watch later even where you know if you got to go take a dump or something or you got to go to work you got to go hang out with your boyfriend your girlfriend you've got the video saved in your watch later and then when you go back in your watch later to finish watching this fantastic video uh shameless plug it will pick you back right up from where you left off so i want to start off with explaining some of the main main deck monsters don't worry this isn't going to have as many proxies as the rescue ace deck uh or the rescue ace video that we did but there are going to be some um still waiting on stuff to come in the mail so i want to talk about the I would say the four main monsters of the deck here. Um, obviously, Shaven, Hoffenis, and Murley are your main go-to fusers. They're all at one for a reason because they're busted. And then Rhino Heart basically being an Armageddon Knight to dump any of these three. Usually, whenever you're summoning Rhino Heart, you're going to dump the Murley just because of the fact that Murley is not a fantastic normal summon, right? Like, if you don't have tier element Scream up... Um, then you're not going to be getting a whole bunch of mills. Murley on normal summon will mill you three. If you've got Scream Up, obviously that's three more. That's a six-card mill. It's basically another copy of an Ishizu Fairy. Um, but, I mean, I really never find myself normal summoning this. Hoffenis, you typically search off of Pellerino if you don't really have any other lines, or you search it off of, like... I don't even know, like, if you have another way to get it into your hand. I can't even think of one off the top of my head. Like, maybe Sulik or something, uh, or Meta Noise. If you're playing Meta Noise, we're not playing Meta Noise in this build, but that's something else that you could play. It's basically a Book of Moon for the deck. Uh, Shayrin is usually the one that you search for off the Pellerino because you can ditch, like, a Dead Horse monster in your hand and then mill three. You ditch an Ashizu Fairy. You can ditch one of the other tier monsters to get their effects. Uh, Sharon is definitely, I would think, the best one. Next to Hoffenis, if you're playing Gen and Ken in tier, then obviously you can be able to trigger Hoffenis easier. But I've already talked about why you should be playing Gen and Ken. Specifically, I made a uh, community post about it. And Gen and Ken in tier element, as a little side note, are good, but they're more like cute. They're kind of like win more, I feel. They're not as bricky as the Horus monsters. But the issue is, is that the one way I found them to be decent in tier is actually not even all that decent because like if you have Hoffenis in hand and then you give the opponent Ken or Gen and that monster activates you can chain Hoffenis to summon in mill three well now you have this plus another level three whether it's Ken or Gen you can make Dante but then Dante mills for cost so it doesn't trigger your tier monsters so it's just garbage so I, we end up cutting Gen and Ken it's interesting in concept but on paper it's it's really booty um so yeah, I mean, these are just your main go-to monsters. You want to be using these to fuse as often as you can. Especially, you know, if you can bring out Hoffenis and Mill 3 and hit, you know, either Sharon or Murley. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's great time and it's bad news bears for the opponent. Um, so as I continue to talk about the deck, let me go ahead and start doing some power shuffling as we always do. 
Um, now I say that this deck is complicated. I would say it's one of, if not the most complicated deck in Yu-Gi-Oh! in recent times. There have been more complicated decks like Sylvan's where the deck literally has a graceful charity in the form of, I think it's literally called like Sylvan Charity. But the problem with that deck is that especially once they changed the, the opening hand from six cards going first to five, uh, it lost a bit of that consistency and you definitely need a lot of brain power to play Sylvan's when the payoff for it is just not really there. Um, it's basically like a deck that can control its own RNG but you have to be able to open properly in order to do so. So it really didn't grasp a lot of the player's attention, especially when the combo lines were just so, so difficult to pull off. So, uh, whereas with tier, especially now that it's been simplified in the sense of getting hit on the ban list, you know, it's basically you just summon a Rhino Heart, send a Merle and Fuse, you know, use things like Beatrice with the Destiny Hero package to, you know, hit your Aigido or your Kelbeck. Uh, and this deck is also very RNG based, you know, depending on what you mill will depend how much you can extend into plays. Um, if you're playing the King of the Swamp package, then you're able to play things like the Graph of Fusion and Rue Kalos. Uh, obviously establishing Rue Kalos gets you insulated from Nibiru. Um, since we're not playing that engine, we're playing the Horus cards, you're able to play things like Galaxy uh, Photon Lord to make that instead of, say, like Zombie Vampire to insulate yourself from something like Nibiru. Um, but what's also nice with Tier in that regard is that your tier element you usually don't give a shit about nibiru it just depends on how good or how bad you open um i am gonna have to have the cards facing me i do apologize for that just because it makes it easier to see what it is that we're working with here um but this was our opening hand we hit the goods in seti that's really disgusting droplets rhino heart and mally i'm testing droplets because you know you can get dead horse monsters out of your hand any sort of dead cards out of your hand to be honest even like the destiny hero stuff that they're sitting dead in your hand right um and also, I feel like Abyss Dweller is going to be an amazing monster this format. You know, if you're going to be playing Tier Element, you need to be playing something like Forbidden Chalice or Droplets so that you have an out to Nibiru. Or, uh, Nibiru, I sound like a Momo. Uh, pfft, uh, Abyss Dweller, sorry. It's like, a, it's past midnight. No wonder my ass is talking about Nibiru. So, um, as we always do on these videos, I'm going to play out this hand, and we're just going to see where it goes, especially with an RNG deck like uh, tier element, you can kind of see where it goes. So for this particular hand, um, I'm going to go ahead and activate Foolish Barrel Goods. Now, again, we talk about choke points in these types of videos. If you open up D-Shifter, as soon as you see the Foolish Barrel Goods come down, or if you just want to shotgun the D-Shifter, you do you, Sugar Boo Bear. Like, if I activate Foolish Barrel Goods and you play Shifter, like, I'm, I'm probably just going to scoop up my cards and not even show you what I'm playing and just hope that you don't open the Shifter again. Uh, because it's just a literal turn skip uh, for this deck. Uh, of course, Foolish Barrel Goods, we're going to dump the Trevor Karma. I feel like Trevor Karma is going to be a mainstay in tier element moving forward. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and activate the Trevor Karma effect now uh, to search us either Scream. Uh, I don't think we can search Sullic, but it doesn't matter. So we wouldn't want to search the Trap card anyway. But we can, basically, the main ones that we're going to go for off the Trevor Karma, it's going to be the Scream or the Pellerino. Uh, in this case, we're going to go for Pellerino. Just because establishing the field spell is so good, getting you a search is just amazing. Um, I have seen some people playing Droll against Tier. It's not the worst thing in the world, but it also depends on how the Tier player opens. You know, if I go Trivacarma to get Pellerino and you Droll me, like, okay, I'm playing with a four card hand, I can't use my M Seti, but also playing Tier Element with Horus isn't very popular, I feel. And. I mean, in this hand's case, it's not really the best thing because I can just go Rhino Heart, dump Merle. Merle's going to fuse with the Mali to make Dangerous. And then I'm just going to be going into Beatrice lines to dump like Aigido or Kelbeck to mill five cards anyway. And once that starts happening, as long as the RNG works in my favor, which I'm milling five cards, it probably will. I'm going to win the ball game through a draw anyway, or at least establish a field that's pretty scary. Keep in mind that Beatrice is a quick effect during either player's turn. So even just establishing the Beatrice, then on the opponent's turn, you can just detach from the Beatrice and dump a fuser and start fusing and doing all your searching. And if the opponent draws you, well, congratulations, Sugar Boo Bear, you just drawled yourself. A lot of people forget that Droll prevents both players from adding cards, but I digress. That came up uh, against an Infernoble player a few months ago at Locals. He drolled himself, and he tried to search off to Randall, and I said, you drolled yourself. He goes, I did droll myself. That was a bad misplay. I'm like, yeah, buddy. 
we proceed to go to a game three right after that. We're going to activate uh, Primeval Planet Pellerino to grab the Shayrin. Um, if you ever have something in your hand, like if I already had Rhino and Shayrin for some reason, you could grab like a tier element cash tier. It's a free chicken nuggy extender. Banish like literally any tier element spell or trap, preferably scream because it's useless in the grave after you search. You can summon it out, mill three, send it to the grave off in effect, mill two more, or if you mill it off of Aigido or Kelbeck, you can mill two more. I'm taking the time to really explain these things because this deck is very complicated. And, you know, as always, if you have questions about this deck, be sure to leave a comment down below. Um, you know, I want people to be able to learn this deck. And, you know, even if you can't really follow along with the combos, at least watching it to learn the choke points is very helpful, I feel. Um, so now, with this hand, I don't want to do any sort of mills because I want to thin through my deck. Um, we're going to activate Horus, pitching the Mali here uh, in order to grab the King Sark and draw a card. Um, again, if you don't open the Horus engine, it just feels so bad, but when you open it, it feels so good. And, you know, you got to keep in mind that this is usually like a five-card package. Like, I'm te like this particular build is playing three Horus, a Happy, and a King Sark. I've seen some builds also play the Dumatef uh, or Dumatef Super Rare. Um, that's like a 2,500 beat stick, so people will play like a 41, 42-card deck. Maybe they even play Zephyros, too. Um, but then, like, milling the King Sark is bad because then it turns off your whole Horus engine. So you end up having to waste either a Keldeo or a Medora, which is at fucking one for a good reason just to put this, excuse me, back in the deck. And it's like, you don't want to be wasting those cards on your own cards usually, like if you can avoid it. So, you know, that that's just another reason why I don't like this engine. Um, it also can get hurt hard by buy steals because M said he's a dark. The summons are inherent, so the opponent will have to shotgun the buy steal. But I mean, if they've got the buy steals to spare, they could hit this and then like hit one of your tier fusers later and it's just bad news bears. So we're going to activate King Sark. Even though the King Star can be used four times a turn, I mean, when you look at our hand, there's nothing I really want to get rid of. So, like, now... Oh, I didn't even draw a card. Hang on. Okay, so we hit tier element cast here. That's kind of like whatever. Like, you could make the argument that I can pitch the droplet here, but it's like, in tier, you want all the resources available to you. I, I just want to mill cards. Like, this d discard... This sends for cost. M steady sends for cost. So, like, you're not getting any sort of tier value. Now, if you're ditching, like, an Aigido or Kelbeck, yeah, there's the value there. But like ditching a Squamata, no value. You ditch Beast, no value. Uh, ditching a Mali, I guess. Like, that's cute. Like, I don't, I don't know. Um, let's go ahead and activate the King Sark, pitching the Droplet. We're gonna dump the Happy because now that gives us access to two level eights in our grave. Um, happy is a Wind, I think. Yeah, yeah. So they can't buy steal us. Uh, and like I said, they're inherent summons, so they got a shotgun that buy steal. Uh, we're gonna go M and then we're gonna go happy. So we've committed to two summons. Now this is what's cool. Again, I still just feel like it's win more. But now with two level eights up, we can make either zombie vampire or we can insulate ourselves from Nibiru by making Photon Lord here. Um for f honestly for flexing case, um I'm just gonna make zombie vampire. Um but do keep in mind that, and this is literally just because I don't have my printout proxy of Photon Lord here. Um, with this particular hand, uh, I would actually just go for Photon Lord in case they nib me. Um, because then if they actually want to blow away my board, they have to have nib and imperm, which has actually come up one time in testing already, and it made me very salty. I'm not going to lie about that. <laughs> so... Yeah, I would actually like attempt to make a Photon Lord here, but just to show off the milling and the RNG of this, we're going to make the Zombie Vampire. Um, let's see. So now we're going to go... The Sharon. The Sharon is nice in our hand at this point. Um, I don't want to banish the Mali to summon Mali because then we're going to have to use the on-field Mali with Merly to make Dangerous, and then we're kind of a sitting duck. Because, uh, like, getting us Denier doesn't really do anything. So let's just normal summon the Rhino. We're going to activate Rhino's effect. We're going to dump the Merly. And I am playing Denier in this build. You can also opt to not play Denier. You just have to kind of use your Mally's. Um, you basically have to get at least one in the grave and then have a card that you're willing to pitch out of your hand to dump that first Mally and banish to summon the second and make Beatrice. But Beatrice is just so insane in this deck. Um, so now the Merly's going to activate because we just Armageddon Knight it, basically. We're going to activate Merly, fusing both the uh, itself and the Mally in order to make the Destiny Hero dangerous. I don't have a good uh, 
Aster Phoenix voice. I'm better with, uh, what's his name? Uh, Jack Atlas, the master of faster. Sounds like I'm saying masturbator faster. <laughs> uh, I've, I have talked at length about that resonator structure deck and how bad it is, but I digress. Um, this is in the far right monster zone because I'm cheeky about my zones. So now with Dangerous, we pitch a card. We can dump a Destiny Hero. Um, I really don't want to pitch this Tier Element Cash Tira. Um, at the same time, I don't want to mill a Mally. Well, actually, you know what? We've got the Mally on the bottom of the deck, so let's just activate it. So we're going to go um, Zombie Vampire. We're going to detach the Happy. This will make both players mill four. So if you're in a Tier Element Mirror Match, you kind of crap your pants here. Actually, you really crap your pants here. Um, hopefully you'll have something to clean that up, up off the venue floor. Um, so we mill four, they mill four. If they milled any monsters, remember that Zombie Vampire can resurrect it. That is one cool thing about this, but again, you're having to play inconsistent crap chorus monsters to get, to get you there. Um, we're going to assume that the opponent didn't mill any monsters and we're not in a tier element mirror match, so we could just revive the Medora here. And since it's a level four, that gives us access to... Um, either Dweller or Time Thief Redoer lines. Uh, we did mill the Sulik, so the Sulik gets us a tier element monster search out of the deck. Um, so we're going to go ahead and go for... We already have Sharon and tier element cache tier. So I'm actually going to go for another tier element cache so that I have some uh, something to ditch out of my hand. Um, you could also make the argument to go for Murley here because then you can go dangerous, pitch the Murley. Then if you get like Shayrin or Hoffenis in a grave, you can fuse with the Murley to make Garua. That's a nice move too. Um, but I'm going to go for the tier element cash tier because I'm going to end up pitching this off the dangerous to dump the Mally. Um, so we did that to search. Let us go ahead and uh, I want to... Eh. So you have a couple different options here, right? And this is actually a perfect example of how tier elements very non-linear because I can either A, make a cross sheep. I can B, make a redoer and sit on that. I like to hold my redoer for like if I need Sharon and then you can detach to banish it till the end phase and rip the top card of the opponent's deck. Um, and then you're able to trigger the Sharon and fuse on their turn, which is always really sexy. Um, and so you have to kind of consider, are you going to have some sort of fusing play coming up? And we do have basically a Beatrice on standby right now uh, with the Dangerous once we commit to it. Um, so I'm going to say that we're just going to risk it for the Biscuit, get the Rhino Heart and Medora back in the grave. We're going to go ahead and go for Cross Sheep. Uh, you could, well, no, you can't go for Dark Charmer here because that's not a Dark, but this is going to be kind of difficult with my keyboard in the way. Rah, there we go. Hopefully you all can see that. No, you cannot. Okay, so this is a cross sheet. We're gonna put this, uh, we're gonna try and put it there. Uh, move this down a little bit. So yeah, and you can see the Pellerino. Okay, not the best view in the world. So anyway, we've got the cross sheet. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and activate Dangerous. We're gonna pitch the Tier Element Cash Tira to dump the Mally. Mally's gonna activate giving us our second Mally. And now congratulations, Sugar Boo Bear. We now have ho oh, oh, Beatrice online. What's great about Beatrice that now we can detach our dangerous to dump off Venice to now fuse into a Drago Scapelia. And we've got Cross Sheep up, which makes this even hotter. So we're gonna activate the Beatrice. If they hand trap us here, yeah, we kind of poop our pants, but I mean if they were going to hand trap us, they would have already tried to deny us the Beatrice at this point. Plus, keep in mind, if we decide to go for Photon Lord, then we could have done that here. And I already mentioned that earlier. So do keep that in mind that that is technically an option. I don't know why I said Mally. I'm detaching off Beatrice to dump the Hoffenis. So now we dump. So now the Hoffenis is going to trigger. So we're going to send back itself and the Dangerous. We, of course, have to shuffle because we searched our deck before we put the Hoffenis on the bottom. Uh... You might be wondering why I'm taking so much time to shuffle. It's because I want the RNG to work in my favor as best as it can. So we'll send back the Dangerous and the Hoffenis. That's going to make us the Dragos Capella. That's then going to trigger our Cross Sheep to let us special summon a level 4 or lower from Grave. So now we could go for Medora again, but we're actually just going to go for Rhino Heart. So we still have one zone open right here. Um, and we could still pitch the Shaven to summon itself. Uh, we could even summon Tier Element Cash Tira, 
and then link off with cross sheep. Yo, this is disgusting AF. <laughs> so this is the other thing with tier. It's like as you're playing out the board, you realize how disgusting it can get when the RNG works in your favor and you don't get hand trapped to hell and back. So I could banish, say, like the Sullic out of my grave to summon the tier element cash at mill three, link off with the cross sheep into like Mask Arena. And then like if I hit another monster like in my hand, like that I'm able to add, then I can pitch it to summon Sharon and then overlay with the Rhino Heart into Redoer and have a fusion play online for the next turn. Um, let's, for funsies, we're gonna go ahead and do that. We're gonna summon out the tier element cash, activate in our hand. We're going to banish the Sullic. And once that resolves, we're gonna activate the uh, tier element cash tier to mill three cards. Oh, and we hit Aigido, Droplet, and Keldeo. So that's really good. So you know what that means, we hit Aigido, we get to mill five more cards from each player's deck, and we are crafting all over the floor if they're on tier. So three, four, five. So we didn't hit anything except for the scream. The scream is going to get solid door hand. This is what I mean where, like, the Horus monsters are just really bad mills. I would rather up my number of diviners, which in this particular build we're only playing one because the Horus monsters, that obviously goes to three once we cut the Horus monsters. Um, but you see, like, how this is bad mills? Like, since M is a dark attribute, I can use it to try and get to Mud Dragon off of, like, Merle or Sharon. But outside of that, I would rather be milling. Like Shadal Beast, I'd rather be milling Squamata. I'd rather be milling Hell Shadal uh, Hollow, which even though that that's a brick, at least like it can get me a couple mills if I have a couple different attributes up. And it's both boards too. So like if the opponent summons out a buy steal, that's another attribute. So this is actually a really good example of how the horse monsters can be kind of booty booty butt cheeks. Um, the scream's gonna activate at least getting us the trap to hand. Um, we've already normal summoned, so we sadly can't special summon the Shayrun. But keep in mind that if we wanted to, we could have pitched the tier element cash tier to summon the Shayrun and mill three that way. And then we could have milled two more off the tier element cash tier. So we still could have got a mill five. Um, which technically, mill number wise, we would have milled more by sending off the tier element cash and summoning Shayrun, milling three, and then milling two. This, this play only got us a mill three, but then we hit the Aigido, which even then, if we did it the other way, it'd still be more mills. Um, but either way, we're going to link off with both of these in order to make the IP mask. Um, and since we are playing Little Knight, Mask Arena has even more value. Um, and then obviously we can't do anything with the Sharon because we just don't have a way to summon it. But yet we have Beatrice up, so we have a fusion during their turn anyway. Um, and then we can just set the Sullic and pass turn. So again, had I planned out my lines better, um, I could have just gone Sharon pitch tier element cash to summon it. And I think really that would have been the better play. Even if we didn't hit Aigido, we would have been getting an Aigido equal uh, equivalent mill because we would have hit three off the tier element Sharon, and then we would have milled two off of the secondary cash tier effect. When sent the grade by a card effect, you get to mill two. Um, so there is that. We also have the option that like, if I even have another M in deck, I could use the King Sark to pitch the Sharon to dump another uh, horse monster to get it out of the deck. It won't trigger the Sharon to fuse because it sends for cost, but it's at least in the grave to where if I dump like Merle or something next turn, I can make, you know, Garua, I can make Kaleido Heart, I can make whatever. Um, but, you know, card economy wise, I think it would have been better just go Sharon, link off with the Rhino Heart, and then have the Redoer rip the top card off the opponent's deck. We take whatever, um, and then we have the Sullic set. So if we establish like a Kaleido Heart, then it's live. So you can see based on this board how things can really start to snowball and why a lot of people say that this is probably the best deck for this format, at least going into YCS Indie. At the time I'm making this video, it's Friday night before Indie. Um, but this is a perfect example of like how the RNG can work in your favor. Let's see if I can hit a hand where the favor does not work for us. Okay, so I've just reassembled the deck. Let's see. I'm just going to do a few shuffles like this. Let's see if like I can open up my entire Horus engine. And like if I open up well, I open up well. I'm not going to play it out again because I mean that first combo that you just saw like took up the entire like first 25 minutes of this video or so before I edit out like the slow points. So we got four, we got five. So we have a Keldeo, Droplet, Sullic, Mothman, and a Rhino Heart. This isn't terrible per se. I mean, you basically have to hope to God that the Mothman gets you there. Um, but 
I mean, it's it's not bad. I think it's a decent example of like how the RNG cannot work in your favor because like if we summon Rhino Heart and dump uh, Murley, we can fuse with the Mothman since they're both darks but different types. So like we can make Mud Dragon and you could do like Mud Dragon plus Rhino Heart into like a Dweller. That's not very good because like the Sulik is dead, the Droplet's kind of whatever at that point, I guess. Um, so like, yeah, you would just have to hope that the RNG of the die roll on the Mothman can like summon itself to draw. Like maybe you hit Sulik. So then like Sulik can search you like Sharon and then you can just pitch Rhino summon Sharon mill three and like you're just in business or pitch Keldeo mill three and then normal summon Rhino. And then, then yeah, like you've got some plays, but just at face value, this is like honestly a good example of like when the RNG just doesn't work in your favor. Like one hand trap kills this if you think about it. Like, you go Mothman, and, like, even if... Well, Ash would be a bad example. If Unless they're a bad player, they're not going to Ash this. Like, they're going to let this go through. And, like, if you hit Sulik, you're going to summon... Draw... Okay, you're going to draw Malin in this case. That's a perfect example. Like, that's a horrible draw. So, the, even if, like, you hit the Sulik and you search, they might just Ash you there. And then if you go summon Rhino, they're, if they imperm you, it's like, okay, you just had all the interruptions. Like, yeah, that's Yu-Gi-Oh! But that's also, like, a good example of where you just don't open up the gas... And it becomes rather difficult. Um, in my testing, I've had hands too where like you just hit all of the ass cheek uh, bricks. Like you're hitting happy, you're hitting like this, uh, this. Like let's throw in a second copy. Like what? What do you even do with this? Like this is awful. And like. Yeah, like, if you were playing, like, Shadal Beast, like, yeah, this could be a beast instead. Like, you're going to get bricks for hands like this, where, like, basically your only play is to go scream, summon Hoffenis, and hope that you hit something off your mills. Um, but I just, I don't like having these Horus monsters in hand when they're literal bricks if you don't have that King Sark. Or, like, if we activate Scream, Summon Hoffenis, and Mill 3, and one of the cards we hit is King Sark, then it's literally an unplayable card. Because I'm not going to summon out two monsters to tribute summon for this dude. Like, it's just not going to happen. And it just, it makes me really not want to play these Horus cards. When it works, oh, mwah, chef kiss. It's so good. But when it doesn't work, you're just sitting here staring at your hand. Like, why, did, why am I even playing these cards? Uh, all the more comedic that... and. Luckily, this hasn't happened to me yet, but I'm sure it will because I have dog water luck in this game where I'm going to open up a hand like that and I'm going to be like, why am I playing these horse cards? And then my opponent's going to shift for me and I'm just going to be staring at him like, you really didn't need to kick me in the dick, but you did anyway. And now it really hurts even more because I bricked. <laughs> like, honestly, because then at that point, like the scream isn't even live with the hot fennis. Um, So then we go two, three, four, five... This hand's actually not terrible. Diviner makes it good, but you lose to one hand trap. Um, because the Happy and Keldeo are terrible. The Droplets is whatever. Um, this is actually a good example of, again, the RNG not working in your favor. Like, yeah, you summon Diviner, which, like I said, you max out on this. Because, like, it, it's just so much better to, be, to get that guaranteed Aikido or Kelbeck hit to middle five. But, like, you summon this and try and dump an Aikido and your opponent ashes you and you're just crapping on the floor. Like we said earlier. <laughs> That's like that's gonna be the title of this video, crapping on the floor with tier element. No. Nah. But yeah, no, like one hand trap just ruins your day here. Like this is where like the Destiny Hero stuff can be kind of dead, but you, again, you can also cut denier if you don't really want to play denier. And you could put I mean this could be anything, should all be used hollow, you know, like it, it it can be whatever card, talents even. I've been messing around with talents called by the grave. Um that that that's what makes tier really adaptable to where you know, are you going to end up with hands no matter what tech cards you play? If you cut this and play something else, you're going to end up with hands that you break no matter what. Like, that's Yu-Gi-Oh! That's the nature of the game. Maybe the opponent doesn't have the hand trap. That's the nature of the game. You summon this, you hit the Aigido, you mill five cards, maybe you hit that Kelbeck, and you're just like, wee! Time to play for 20 minutes! Literally, because I think the one combo I did in this video took 20 minutes. Overall, what are some choke points with this deck? Like I said, D-Shifter. Nibiru plus Imperm breaks any board in the game of Yu-Gi-Oh. Um, even though, like I said at the beginning of this video, you are tier, you don't care about Nibiru, uh, having your board broken to a Nibiru can still really suck, especially if you can't recover. Uh, that's why tier decks play things like Baron, or if they're playing the King of the Swamp package, playing things like Root, Kalos, and Graffa for the negates. Um, I'm personally really leaning towards more of the King of the Swamp engine 
um, with possibly, well, more likely cutting the uh, denier um, and definitely maxing out on droplet just to be able to beat dweller. If you're a deck that's going first that can make dweller, by all means make dweller and hope that they don't have the droplet or have the negate for the droplet and hope that like you know the opponent doesn't ditch like a trap or something like if you're sitting on like a i don't know a solemn judgment or whatever um and like you know you don't lose the droplet um the thing is though is that decks that can make dweller outside of like rescue ace usually don't lose to nib problem with rescue ace is that they have to commit to more than five summons to go down like dweller lines and stuff and like they have to modulate levels and it's it's not convenient um but like it is still there um dweller hurts shifter hurts droll can hurt depending on how they open uh a well-timed ash can maybe hurt uh, a well-timed uh, well an imperm on like a diviner or a rhino heart when that's the only play really hurts um ghost bells are okay but like I think buy steals are just better. Like buy steals is this whole like you you want to take a crap on this deck. Just play buy steals because like well buy steals. Remember that Shayrin, Merlin, Hoffenus are all darks and they're all at one. So if you buy steal the tier player three times and you hit Merlin, Hoffenus, and uh, Shayrin, uh, they're they're poop, they're pooping their pants. Like they're peeing and they're pooping their pants because they have no way to fuse. Like, outside if they're playing polymerization with King of the Swamp, even then they got to send that back with Keldeo or Medora. Uh, just to be able to get that poly back and hope that they can do something. But outside of that, they really don't have a way to play the game. And then it's like, well, if you can't fuse, you're going to lose. D barrier hurts as well, locking them out of fusions because it's like, what are they going to do? Like play their link monsters? Like, okay, I guess they can maybe sit on like a little knight or something or like a dweller or a redoer if they've got the gas for it. But I mean, outside of that, they're really not going to have much. So at the end of the day, this deck is honestly not that hard to beat if you know what you need to side, if... You know, you know where the choke points are in this deck. If you're able to play things like Shifter, you just auto win the ball game. Like, you win the whole World Series at that point because it's just that good against tier. But overall, there are several different ways to play the deck. It's very adaptable. I do think it's one of the best decks in the room. Um, it's just going to be a matter of how is it that people are building it post YCS Indie. Um, because this is definitely the deck that I'm going to be playing for regionals. It's just a matter of, you know, building it correctly and, and seeing how we do with it. And, you know, for you to learn and for you to get better. And, you know, don't be discouraged by this deck just because it is very combo heavy. You know, if you're not a very good combo player, that's okay. It's about learning the choke points, knowing how to beat the deck, and, and going from there. So, guys, let me know what you think down in the comments below. If you have any questions, I'll do my best to respond to them. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you in the next video.